Thank you for joining us today for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, click the link down below or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now, let's join Senior Pastor Henry Jones as he teaches from the Word of God. Well, over about 26 years ago, I walked into our pastor's office and I said, I have found the building we're going to put in the center of the county. And I laid it on his desk. He said, Coburn, you have lost your mind. We are not going to put a tent in the middle of the county. I said, yes, we are. I promise you, this is what the Lord showed me. And today, on December 3rd, 2023, it is 20 years to this very day that we've had our very worship service. We have seen God do some incredible things over these last 20 years on this property. We have seen an admin building constructed, a children's worship building constructed. Just last month, we have finished up our new youth utility building, which is our youth building. We're always doing new projects. So you may be asking, what's next? I got good news for you. We're getting ready to show you a video of how this building was built. And if you pay real close attention the last 30 seconds of the video, we're going to show you our very next project here at River of Life of what God's leading us to do. Are you ready? Are you ready to see how the dome, the tent, the marshmallow, the redneck Taj Mahal was built? Here it goes. I'm Wade Hilton. I came to the center of the county with River of Life from Sop Choppy because this is the most dynamic, spirit-filled, and exciting church in the world. And I can't imagine myself being in this. I made this journey from Sopchavi here because I believe in the dream of an interracial, interdenominational church. We say that God won't let me go anywhere else. Sheila and I have been attending River of Life since April of 2019. We came to River of Life based on the direct and clear leadership of the Holy Spirit to lead the church we both had attended for almost 50 years. The reasons we remain at River of Life are me. Hi, my name is Araminta Harris. Uh, I joined the church at the beginning because I was looking for a church where I could feel comfortable and feel the spirit of the Lord. And at that first Sunday, I just knew this was the place to be. Hello, I'm Rusty Heron. The Lord led me to River of Life 10 years ago to give my life to Him and to give Him my offerings my service, my time, and my talents. What's kept me at River of Life for 10 years? Serving the Lord and serving my church family. Hi, my name is Sarah Starling. I've been a member of River of Life for 11 years. And what brought us here was we were new parents. And we were exhausted with a newborn baby and we just needed help um, with someone to watch him for about an hour. So we came to River of Life and we loved it. And what has kept us here is the community that we've found here. It has truly become our family. My name is Kate Epperson, and my family and I have been at River of Life since 2014. 
We actually were visiting family in 2013 when we visited River of Life and felt the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in such a tangible way that we felt like God was leading us here to Florida to attend River of Life. So we have been there since 2014 because we still feel the presence of God and we have had great fellowship with many brothers and sisters through the years. Hi everyone, this is Pastor Blackie and I have been a River of Life member along with my family going on 11 years now. When we first moved to the county and didn't know anybody, we were really just looking for something that sort of stood out to us and God brought us to River of Life through not only the uniqueness of the dome, but also we found River of Life through the website. This is a church congregation that loves my family. They support us, uh, good times and bad. And we know here we're going to hear God's word, and that's why we're at River of Life. Hi, my name is Arlena Miller, and my family and I have been attending River of Life for a little over two years. We moved here from North Carolina, and I checked out a recorded sermon Pastor Henry preached and where the late Brother Al prayed. I knew we had to visit this church because there was so much power in the word and prayer I had heard. After visiting one Sunday morning, service was absolutely amazing. So we attended Wednesday night Bible study, and it only got better with Derek Gray's teaching of God's word. My husband and I wanted to make sure we planted our family in a church where the word of God was preached and a place we could grow spiritually. River of Life has been that place for us and so much more. We've come a long way, and, and what you're seeing right now um, is a picture of what our renovation will look like, and there will be a huge LED wall here. The stage will be changed. This is the good part, and that is that right now we seat about 700 people. Uh, we could, if we were maxed out, we would seat about 700. Once this renovation is done, we'll be able to seat 1,000 people in this dome. And so, now why would we do that? You look around, you see a few empty seats today, so why would we increase to 1,000? Because if you expect God to do great things, you prepare for God to do great things. And so, So I am excited and humbled to have been a part of all of this, and I look forward to the days ahead. I believe we're just beginning. I believe the best part is ahead of us. And uh, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for your support through the years. Thank you for uh, making a commitment. Thank you for joining arms with other Christians. And I got to tell you something that you already know. Walcala County needs a savior. The whole world does, but this is our county. This, this is our Judea. And Walcala County needs a move of God. And, and I believe God brought us here. Uh, I think he planted us in the center of the county. And uh, I believe we're just getting started. I think our future is brighter than ever before. Well, what I have to say this morning is entitled Marathon message marathon message and uh, let me let me explain the title most of the time I, I don't take time to explain my titles but I want to explain this title today the first reason for the title of the message is this the Lord gave me this message started burning it in my heart uh, in the city of marathon in the Florida Keys and, and so that's where it all started, but 
There's another reason for the title, one that's obvious and one that's more important. And that is that the Christian life is not a sprint running as fast as you can for a short distance. It's not flash in the pan. It's not burning hot for a few days, few weeks, for a season, or even a few years, and then settling in and not doing much after that. No, no. The real Christian life is a marathon. It is a long distance, long lasting race of endurance, sometimes difficult, sometimes painful, sometimes sacrificial, but at the same time, it, it, is, uh, it is glorious. The Christian life, it, there's sacrifice on one hand, and then it's glorious on the other hand. Uh, the first scripture I'll share with you this morning is this Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, the word patience there means endurance. In fact, some translations actually say endurance. So let us run with patience and endurance. That, that talks about commitment and sacrifice and, and, and sometimes painful. But at the same time, then we're looking unto Jesus, our inspiration, our motivation, our hope, and our help. And so we run with patience. We look unto Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I think... Uh, the saddest, I, I know we have scriptures that we read and we think, man, that is so inspirational. But I want to share with you one of the saddest scriptures I've ever found in God's word. Uh, this is when the apostle Paul spoke to the Galatian church. In Galatians 5, 7, this is what he said. You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Could you find a scripture? That would be more sad than that. Who hindered you that you did not obey the truth? I, I'm asking you tomorrow if you checked your mail and you received a letter from some respected spiritual leader and, and the letter read something like this. I was so proud of you the day you walked down that aisle and gave your heart to Jesus. I, I, I was thrilled when you were baptized uh, and then watching you <clears throat> in those early days. As you served the Lord, and you were so excited, and you had so much zeal and so much energy. And then what if the letter said, you were doing so good. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Wouldn't that break your heart? If you receive it, what if we receive that as a church? What if somebody were to write us a letter, somebody we love and respect, and what if somebody were to say this to us? Oh, I remember those early days when River of Life was born in the fire of God's revival. I, I, I remember the excitement, the zeal that burned in the hearts. I, I remember the hours that members of River of Life were on their face crying out to God. And, and, and the pursuit and the passion and the commitment and the dedication that was there in the beginning. And I've watched through the years and I've seen so much going on at River of Life. But then what if there was this line that said, you were doing so good. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Now I'm standing before you on the 20th anniversary of this dome. 20 years ago today, I stood right here and I preached. And I'm standing before you right now to tell you 20 years later, we will never receive that letter. We will never receive that letter. I say that with confidence because I know every member of the staff and I know every member of the board and I know all the leaders of this church and we don't have one leader in this church that's even close to compromising or letting up. That's not going to happen with us. Every now and then, individuals and churches need to be reminded that the Christian life is not a playground. I think Pastor Coburn said this just a few days ago. It's not a playground. It's a battlefield. Every now and then, individuals and churches need to be reminded that the Christian life is a marathon. 
And it's a marathon we have to run. And we run it with endurance. We run it with patience. We run it with commitment. And we run the race when it feels good and when it doesn't feel good. And we run the race um, uh, when people are applauding and when they're not applauding. Uh, we, we run the race no matter what. And the condition of the world around us does not determine whether we run or not. We run because our Savior has told us to run this race. And then, listen to this. God's called us to run the race with truth in hand and commitment and determination. But he also gives us something to look forward to. Uh, 2 Peter 1.11 says, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now what's that all about? See, we're in a marathon, we're in a race, we're in a time of commitment. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's sacrifice, sometimes the world loves us and sometimes they hate us. But what God is doing in this scripture is he's putting a finish line out in front of us. And this is what he says. He says, don't forget this. And by the way, you cannot forget this. For so an entrance will be supplied to you. What's that word? Abundantly, God's got something big in store for you, for me, for all of us. When we cross that finish line. I'm telling you, one of these days, God's going to minister to you and to me and to all of his children a grand and glorious entrance into the kingdom. I don't know what it's all about. Ray's mother knows now. Uh, and the other saints in this church who have gone home to be with the Lord, I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm telling you, God's got something big and glorious. It, it, it's going to be beyond our comprehension right now. But I'm telling you what a day that will be. When my Savior's face, I shall see. What a day that will be. Oh my goodness. Now, why is that scripture there? Because sometimes it doesn't feel good right now. But we keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You hear where I'm coming from? If you keep your gaze on the world, you will not run well. You have to glance at the world, but you keep your gaze on Jesus. And you run with patience the race that is set before you for the glory of God. Somebody here is discouraged this morning. Somebody here is struggling this morning. And you know what I want to say to you? That happens. Didn't Jesus say in this world you shall have persecution? But he said what? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And this is the promise he gives us. That one day you'll cross that finish line and an abundant entrance will be given to you. A glorious and magnificent and holy and spectacular entrance will be given to you as you, enter the, as you cross the finish line and enter the, the presence of the Lord. I got to tell you, friends, on that day, you're going to say it was worth it all. It was a small thing. The sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. There's a glorious finish line. But until we cross that finish line, we run. We run with endurance. We run with patience. We run with commitment. And we never Stop. Now, how do we do it? That's what I want to share with you this morning. How do we do it? How, how, do, we, how do we keep from being hindered? Who, who led you astray? That's what Paul said to the Galatian church. You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? How do we, how do we keep from being hindered? How do we keep from slowing down? How do we keep from getting off track? Because it's easier than you might think. How, how do we stay strong? How do we stay inspired? How do we stay motivated to keep running with endurance and patience and keep our eyes on Jesus? How do we do it? Now, the answer to that question is so big, I, I really can't address it all this morning. Honestly, I'm not exaggerating. There are hundreds and thousands of things that you and I can do to stay inspired. By the way, being in church, singing his praises, that's a wonderful thing. There's all kinds of things you can do. But I want to share with you two things this morning that are, that are absolute prerequisites 
of running with patience, running the marathon, and finishing that marathon. If you don't have these two things, you will not do it. You, you cannot do it. These are, these are the two things. First of all, commitment. Say commitment. commitment. It, it doesn't roll off our tongues real well, does it? Yeah, when we start talking about discipline and commitments, oh my goodness. And, and don't, let, don't let anybody fool you, friends. The Christian life, the successful, victorious, glorious Christian life is not something that just happens. There's no such thing as casual Christianity. And that's the reason Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, then it bears much fruit. Jesus said it's an all-out commitment. It's dying to self. It's dying to the world. It, it, is, it is a commitment. Th think about this. No one runs a marathon without an all-out commitment. I read one article that says if you're going to run a marathon, it, it, you, you have to start no later than uh, five months before the marathon. And, and then you start getting ready, and there's a training regiment, and you eat, and you, you, you sleep, and you live, and you train for the marathon. Five months. If you've ever run a marathon, would you please stand up? <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait. Come on. Stand up if you've ever run a marathon. Come on. Stand up. Come on. What? Hold on. Hold on. Stand up. I want to rebuke those who were slow to stand up. That's one of the greatest. I, that's one of the greatest feats. I Stand up. You stand up. Do not be ashamed of such a commitment. So, uh, there was endurance. There was commitment. I, I thank you. You may be seated now. <laughs> Always do what your pastor tells you. No, I'm <laughs> Am I misleading the congregation? It takes commitment. It takes endurance. You have to work at it. It's an all-out commitment. It's with all of your, your, your body and your heart. You, you, you have to live it. Well, friends, there's no difference running the race that God has set before us. Don't you think for a moment that you can be casual and run this race? No, you go all the way. You go all the way. You give it everything you have. I, I have this article in my files. It's been there for, I think, maybe 40 years. And it's a declaration of faith. It's a, it's a, a, a declaration of discipleship. And, and I've tweaked it a little bit, but I want to share it with you this morning. And every time I say the word I... I want you to think you. When I say I, I want you to think about River of Life because to me this has River of Life written all over it. Here we go. The die is cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will not give up, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I can't. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I, I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, positions, promotions, platitudes, or applause. Those things are nice, but not necessary. I don't have to be first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. He's enough. And I'm his disciple. I now live by faith. I love by patience. I lift by prayer. And I labor by power. And I can. Because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. My course is set. I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. 
I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, and I absolutely, positively will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. That's not what disciples do. And I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this church is filled with disciples of Jesus Christ. And what do disciples do? They do what their Savior and Lord tells them to do. They run with patience and endurance the race that is set before them. And they never slow down. And they keep going because their eyes are on Jesus. I do. I declare over this church right now, if the whole world around us falls away from the faith, we will not. We're going to stay with the Word of God. Now, I know there are pastors and churches that are as committed or even more committed than we are, but I'm just saying, this is a what if. I'm telling you, if every pastor in this nation compromises the Word of God and begins to change God's Word to fit the culture, they can do it. We will not. We will stay the course. And if thousands come or thousands leave, We're going to stay with God's Word. When it feels good and when it doesn't feel good. When it's popular and when it's not popular. You see, you don't change the Word of God to fit your lifestyle. You don't change the way a church ministers to fit the culture. You preach the pure Word of God until the Word of God changes the culture around you and brings people to the saving knowledge Of our Lord Jesus Christ. My wife posted this the other day. And so I have to give her credit. I don't know where she got it from. But it says the church can never be the salt of the earth. If we keep sugarcoating our message. We're not going to do it. I'm telling you. we've, We've talked with the staff. Our board meeting this past Thursday night, Pastor Coburn was leading that board meeting, and I walked out of there so excited. I wish every one of you could have been in that board meeting. We were reminiscing about the glory of God in the days past, and we were gazing into the future, and we were talking about revival and, 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 and like a second great awakening that will stir our hearts. And by the way, church, we desperately need a revival, and I'm not talking about reaching Wakala County. I'm talking about our God reaching us and setting our hearts on fire and thrilling our souls and bringing us to a place of obedience where we put Him first and we do what He tells us to do. Oh, friends, we need a revival. And there is a commitment among leadership, and I believe in your hearts also, that we're going to go after God and go all the way. I think we've got some great, great days ahead of us. So we need that kind of commitment, that kind of commitment. I'm not going to turn around. I'm not going back. The second thing we need is obedience. Now, you say, I've heard commitment and obedience my whole life. I don't know. Have you really heard the kind of commitment that says good or bad, sink or swim, live or die? Excuse my expression, come hell or high water. I'll serve the Lord. That's commitment. Now, let's talk about obedience and let's take it to a deeper level. A deeper level of obedience. And I'm talking about real obedience. Now, I want to take you back to Marathon, Florida. We were down there during lobster season. I I don't remember the exact date. Uh, uh, Quite a few people from this church. We had 20 people there, I guess. And and so so we were staying in a couple uh, uh, rooms there in the condominium. And one day everybody left. And they all went fishing. But I didn't go. And then I I don't know where everybody went. They were visiting or shopping or I was there all alone. I got my Bible out. I started reading. And if you want God to speak to you, friends, I highly recommend this. Start getting your Bible. 
Get in your mind. Not only will he speak to you through the word, but he will bear witness with the word. And as you're in the word, you'll begin to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so I was, I was reading. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to write a poem. Now, there's a problem with that. And now, I love poetry. I memorize poetry. I quote poetry. I use poetry in my ministry. But about 40 years ago, I decided I was going to be a poet. And you've heard that expression, a poet, and you don't even know it. <laughs> I'm not a poet, and I know it. I'm just saying. I tried and failed. I'd write poetry and share it with somebody, and they'd say, I don't know where you got that. I don't like that. That's no good. So I gave up. And I quit. Forty years later, I'm in Marathon, Florida. I'm sitting in front of my computer and the Holy Spirit says, write a poem. I said, okay. I'll give it a shot, but I don't, I don't have much hope here. And, and so I started writing. And friends... I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in an absolutely amazing way. I'm about to share something with some of you that's going to change your life and it's going to change your future. I felt the presence of the Lord. And then there was this anointing that, that came over me. And I knew something good was about to happen. Now I want to just stop right there just for a minute. I want you to listen to me. Do you understand that sometimes God will ask you to do something, inspire you to do something, lead you to do something that you've already failed at miserably a dozen times? You don't believe me, do you? By the way, God will ask you to do something that you're not qualified to do. And if you think just for a moment, that's a pretty absurd statement, isn't it? Because if God tells you to do something... You are qualified to do it. L listen, your little becomes enough in His hands. G God, will God will take what you have and use it for His glory. A and I'm telling you, there are some of you here and you tried something in the past and you failed at it and you are afraid to try it again. And I'm telling you that the kind of obedience you need, listen, this is important, the kind of obedience that every one of us need is this kind of obedience, that we will obey the voice of the Lord and we will not let past failures interfere with present obedience. You can't do it. D did you know in the Bible, we, we find it in the Bible, that there were people in the Bible who had failed miserably when they did it in their own strength, and then the Holy Spirit told them to do it, and they did it, and it was life-changing. How about Moses? What about Moses? Moses was roughly 40 years old. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly. And Moses decided that he was going to defend his, 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 his people, the Jewish people. He had realized that he was of the Jewish nation. And he decided to defend them and help them. And guess what happened? He failed miserably. And you know what the great Moses did? He ran for his life. He was scared that he was going to be killed. And he left the luxury of Egypt and he ran for his life Forgive me, but like a coward, he wouldn't stay. And 40 years later, God sent him back to do the very thing he was running from. And Moses went back to Egypt. And this time he delivered the whole nation. Oh, and I got a special word for some people today who have gray hair. Moses was 80 years old when God sent him back. And if you failed at 40 and you're 80 now and God tells you to go back and do it, you go back and do it and you don't use age as an excuse. You do what God tells you to do. I'm talking about the kind of obedience that will not allow past failures to interfere with present obedience. 
Now, we're talking about running the race with patience. And friends, you want to get excited about that race? Just start doing what God tells you to do. How about Simon Peter? Think about Simon Peter just for a moment. Was he on, uh, Simon was the, was the voice of the twelve. He, he was, you know, I like, what I like about Simon Peter is he makes those of us who are loudmouths feel good about ourselves sometimes. He was the voice of the twelve. He was the spokesman. He was this bigger than life person and he walked with Jesus for three years. He walked with the physical embodiment of God for three years, night and day, 24 hours a day. He saw the glory of God. Think about it. You and I pray and fast for a glimpse of glory, for a moment in his presence, for, for, for just, a, just a word from God. Simon walked with him for three years and then guess what he did? He denied him. He cursed that he knew him. And he was so ashamed of himself and what he had done that he went out and wept bitterly. I don't want to show of hands, but have you ever done something you were so ashamed of and so embarrassed that you were broken and you went out and wept? I know I have. I know I have. That's what Simon Peter did. But listen to this. Isn't this insane? But when the moment was right, God didn't pick any of the other disciples. He picked Simon Peter to stand on the day of Pentecost and preach, and 3,000 souls got saved. He could have chosen any of the other 11. Why did he choose the one that denied him? That's the way God does things. Now, somebody could have been in the crowd that day and said, Simon Peter, you're not going to preach to me. I know what you did. You're a failure. I know what happened not long ago. You turned your back on God. You denied. You cursed. Let me tell you something, friends. When God calls you to do something, we're talking about a deeper level of obedience now. When God calls you to do it, you do it. I don't care what anybody thinks. You preach, you testify, you share your faith, you teach a class. Oh, two years ago, you may have blown it, but right now, you're not blowing it. Your past is behind you, it's under the blood, you're in step with Jesus, you're doing what he tells you to do, and God takes your brokenness, makes something beautiful out of it. This is good stuff, whether you know it or not. Well, God gave me this poem, and I tell you, it has changed my life. It, is, it has taken me to a new level of excitement as I run this race. It has become for me a, a roadmap, a blueprint on daily living. It's just a simple poem, but it has become so powerful in my life. Listen up. Do you want to hear this poem? Yeah. After all that buildup, it's not going to be that. <laughs> it's not going to be that good. Here it is. By the way, <laughs> by the way, one by one, when they came in from fishing, I'd say, hey, I found this poem. I didn't tell them I wrote it. I found this poem. What do you think? Oh, that's good. That's good. I didn't get what I had 40 years ago. Here it is. Off with the old and on with the new. God's word tells me exactly what to do. Laying aside the filthy and sinful part, I can have a clean, pure heart. Blessed in all my ways, his word to receive, so my actions can line up with what I believe. If I hold on to the world and the past, I will not last. But if in his word I stay, this can be another salvation day. I love it. Thank you, Bradley. Bradley gave me a standing ovation. Thank you, Bradley. Woo. Now I got to tell you, friends, that poem to me is, is uh, an echo, a reflection 
of God's word. Because I didn't make any of this up. I just put it in poetic form. The Bible tells us that on a daily basis, we have to take things off and put things on. Read your Bible. According to James, the first chapter, we have to continually lay aside the filthy and sinful things of this world. We live in a filthy, corrupt world that, that, that's flooding our culture with indecency and ungodliness and filth. And, and everything contrary to God, we have to take off the old, put on the new. We have to lay aside the filthy things of this world. And it's not a once and for all deal. You have to do it every day of your life. And then you stay in God's Word. Listen, some of you are reading God's Word and it's not doing you a bit of good. You're just getting head knowledge. You stay in God's Word until your, your, your words, your actions, your walk lines up. With the word of God. And then friends you quit making excuses. You let go of the past. And you obey God. And you stay in his word. And every day turns into a salvation day. Yes. I got to tell you. My, my whole perspective. Has changed. Since I wrote that poem. I, I, by the way I have it on my iPad. So the moment I open my iPad. It's right in front of me. Every morning. I quote it during the day. It, it's become that roadmap for me. Maybe the Lord will give you something. I'll share this one with you if you want me to. But I got to tell you, every day is changing for me. I, I'm having, I shared some of this with you before. I'm having this ongoing salvation experience at Blue Ribbon Cleaners in Tallahassee. I know that sounds crazy, but a while back, maybe a year ago, I started taking crosses and witnessing to them. I'd been going in there for years. How do we go somewhere for years and never identify ourselves as children of God and not share the good news of Jesus Christ? How do we do that? We do that when we're meandering in the maze of mediocrity and we're not marching as disciples of Christ. I went in there one day. I was scared. I was nervous. I didn't know how they'd respond. I started giving them all crosses. I started talking to them. I started sharing my faith with them. And then one day I went in, and, and I think her name's Yolanda. Yolanda, you've heard me say some of this. Yolanda said, what's the word of the day? I quoted scripture. Next time I went in, she said, you going to quote scripture? And then one day I went, and I always do. And, then, and I learn. I got, I, listen, before I go to the cleaners, I make sure I've got a word. <laughs> well, wait, now, wouldn't that be a good exchange? They clean my clothes, and I give them the water of the word, which can cleanse their hearts. <laughs> and and, 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 and so, so I went in one day, and she said, what's the word of the day? And I started quoting scriptures, and she turned, and she said, I told you to have something for us today. And then not too long after that, one day I couldn't go to the cleaners and my wife went by the cleaners to pick up my clothes and they said, where's the pastor? <laughs> and she said, well, he couldn't be here today. You know what they said to her? You have to share a word with us. She said, I, I had to pull up a verse and just remember a verse. And I shared a verse with them. I, and listen, there are amazing things happening in that cleaners. The other day I bought something and I needed it pressed immediately. And it was late. It was like four o'clock in the evening. I know that they shut all those steamers down uh, earlier. So I can't get it pressed. And I thought to myself, I'm going to go buy the cleaners anyway. Maybe they'll do it for me. Maybe they know how to crank it back up. And so I went by the cleaners, and when I walked through the door, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they're back, they're steaming clothes. And I said, wait, y'all are still working? They said, yeah, yeah, all the machinery shut down about 2 o'clock today. And for several hours it was down, and now we're having to work late. I, you know what I said to the lady? I said, you mean to tell me that the misfortune of what happened here today was for my good fortune so that y'all could press my clothes when I get in here? <laughs> she looked at me. She said, well, maybe. <laughs> I believe God shut it down because he knew that one of his children would show up at 4 o'clock that needed something pressed that day. 
And God got involved. And if you look at me today and say, Pastor, I think you're losing your mind, then I'm going to look at you and say, I think you're losing your faith and you're forgetting what God will do for his children. You get the favor of God on you, and you walk with Him. You take off the old, put on the new, get rid of the filth, stay in the Word, and start walking it out. And I'm telling you, friends, a favor of God will rest on you. Oh, man. Man, how much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> hey, I got to share. I'll, I'll abbreviate some of these. I was in Harbor Freight. You'll be surprised where God shows up if you'll just walk with him. I'm in Harbor Freight. I got whatever I had to buy. I don't even remember. I'm standing in line. There's one person right in front of me. There's about four guys behind me. I'm standing in Harbor Freight. And, and this guy just, he's just, he's having problems. And, and it got so long that the lady behind the counter looked at me and she's rolling her eyes. And oh, what? And I'm just standing there. And friends, I'm not making this up. The Spirit of the Lord came on me. And he turned and he looked at me. And when I looked at him, I said, buddy, it's all right. I said, God is using you right now. He said, what'd you say? <laughs> I said, God is using you right now. And, and, and he said, well, I, what does that mean? I think maybe he thought I was being smart with him. I said, no, no, no. I'm serious about this. This is exactly what I said. I said, the favor of the Lord is on me right now. And God is using you to hinder my steps to keep me right here because he has an appointment for me that I will miss if you don't hold me up. And I line not. I had about four guys behind me just start laughing. <laughs> when the presence of the Lord moves in, it, it just kind of diffuses that, that kind of stuff. And he said, well, I'm glad God's using me. He said, I'm. <laughs> and, and anyway, uh, uh, when he finally finished, then I went up and I paid. And that lady looked at me and I said, it's okay. I'm serious. I said, God, uh, God will delay us sometime. Hey, yeah. do you hear me? Now, I've already probably said something from this pulpit I shouldn't say, so I might as well say something else I shouldn't say. When you're in a situation like that, you can get your panties in a wad, act like the devil, and miss God if you want to. But isn't it time for us to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and take every moment the Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. I'm not trying to tell you I'm righteous, but I am trying to tell you that when a man's right with God, God will order his steps. And he'll sometimes make you stop stepping and stay in one place. Listen, I walked out of that situation. I walked out of that situation. Lena, I went straight to the hospital. I walked into the hospital room. Al was in there. Presence of the Lord's thicker than I've ever felt it in a hospital room in my life. I lie not, wasn't it? It was amazing. And, and, and I walked in, and I walked all the way across the room, and I stood there because somebody else was talking to Al, and a nurse walks through the door. And when she walked through the door, the Spirit of the Lord fell on her. She started spinning round and round. Uh, she started, you met this nurse. She started spinning round and round, and she started praising God, and she started prophesying, and, and I am sitting over there, and I said, thank you, God, for that man that was in front of me at Harbor Freight. Because if I'd have been there 20 minutes earlier, I'd have missed that. And God wanted me to experience that. I'm trying to tell you that we have a God that gets involved in every area and every facet of our lives. Hey, I got one more. I got one more. I got one more. See, this is the problem. This is the problem when you go three or four weeks without preaching. It's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a problem. So some months ago, I was at the community center playing pickleball. I know. I know. Y'all are rolling your eyes right now. 
But we, my wife and I were there, and I was sitting. I wasn't playing at that time, and this guy walks through the door. This guy walks through the door. I don't even remember who it was. I leaned over to the person next to me, and I said, who is that? And the lady told me his name. And she said, but you don't want to mess with him. He's an atheist. (laughs) Child of God, please listen to me. When the devil tells you to stay away from somebody, it's because he does not want you to walk out what God has given you to do. And we are to be lights in a dark world. Man, an atheist. Man, that's a bullseye. <laughs> Said, he, he's, an, he's an atheist. I tell you, I stood straight up. I walked straight over to him. I put my hand out and I said, hey, I am Henry Jones. And he gave me his name. And, and, then, and then this is what I said to him. I said, I want to invite you to our church. That's all I said. I want to invite you to come to our church. River of life. You know what he said? What time does the service start? (laughs) I was shocked. I thought I was getting ready to get into this, you you know, this spiritual battle where I was going to share the light and love of Jesus. He said, what time does it start? I said, 1030. 1030 Sunday morning, the next Sunday morning, he shows up at church. From that day, that's been maybe five months, I don't know, months ago. From that day to this day, I don't think he's ever missed a Sunday morning service. Martin, stand up. This is Martin. Wave at everybody. Now, now listen to me. This is the neat part. So later on, I didn't know how to share. I said, Martin, they told me you was an atheist. And he said, this is, and it's interesting. He said, nothing could be further from the truth. Do, do, do you know that Martin is here? He's worshiping the Lord. He told me the other day, he said, there's two things I do pretty much right now. I play pickleball and I invite people to church. <laughs> We're getting ready to do uh, these life groups uh, where the battle for the mind, he's going to be hosting a life group. He has become a dear friend. We have so much fun together. I, 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 I'm, what I'm saying to you, friends, is this. Don't let the devil keep you from the blessings that God has for you. And when God says go, you go. When God says speak, you speak. When God tells you to do something, you do it. You make an all-out commitment like it's a marathon, and it is a marathon, and then you go into deep levels of obedience, and you don't let the past hinder you from doing what God wants you to do right now. And I'm telling you, child of God, there will be inspiration. There will be strength. There will be motivation to run with patience the race that is set before us. Would you bow with me in prayer? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Now, if you're here and you're not sure of your salvation, then I want to invite you to come forward at the invitation. And let me or one of the pastors here at the front pray with you. Did you know the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if you will repent, ask Jesus to come into your heart, you can be saved. And I got to tell you, friends, it, it, that, I mean, a lot of people see that, oh, I have to give my life up. And you do, but it, you receive something that's 10,000 times better. I invite you to give your heart to Christ. If you need to join this church, I want you to come and join this church this morning. The Holy Spirit will lead you. But here's what I want every Christian, every Christian in the house, would you be willing to make a deeper commitment today than you've ever made before? I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
I'm not going to ponder at the pool of popularity. No. I'm not going to meander in the maze of mediocrity. No. Today I go all the way with my God. All the way with my God. And then would you make a commitment that you will do what God tells you to do? No matter how many times you failed at it. No matter if you think you're qualified or not qualified. No longer using age as an excuse or even the lack of talent. You do what God tells you to do. If, if you would make that commitment, seal the deal at this altar. Here's what I tell you, friends. You'll find that this marathon is going to be tough at times. But there will be all the inspiration you need to stay the course all the way to the end. Father, I thank you for letting me preach this message. I thank you for uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit here. And, and I ask you, dear Lord Jesus, that many commitments will be made. Decisions will be made with eternal consequences this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? And as we... Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200. Or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and directions.